We've covered in the last module basic contract understanding, what needs to be included to make it legally binding. We're now going to talk about how you can personalize your commercial terms as part of your contract. The first point we'll cover is how to decide and include the ideal term for the contract, and this will vary based on each individual contract. Secondly, we'll discuss how to detail your pricing and include any incentives to encourage growth in your business. Thirdly, we will discuss how to set payment terms and what provisions you need to include to protect your business. Fourthly, we will discuss how to clearly define the specific responsibilities of each party in the contract. Then we will set out how to include customer service policies related to refunds, compensation, aftercare service and any guarantees that you want to define with your products. Point number six will cover how you can set personal terms and conditions to protect your specific business needs. Point number seven, we will discuss termination rights, who has them, notice periods and how to execute terminations. And lastly, we'll discuss some general rules to adhere to as you put together your commercial terms. When you sit down to consider the needs of your business for each commercial contract that you're likely to put in place, the first thing you need to consider is the term of the contract. And you're likely to have different needs for different types of contracts. Sometimes the priorities will be stability and knowing the pricing. And sometimes you'll want more short term flexibility to take advantage of fast moving marketplace. A contract can be as short or as long as the parties want it to be. And of course, there are pros and cons of both long and short term contracts. If you're the seller, the upsides of a long term contract would include stability in the income you'll be having flowing into your business. And this will help you manage your cash flow. You'll also understand the output that is needed in terms of the service you're providing or the goods that you need to provide. And knowing this will allow you to manage your workforce and your operations more efficiently. It will also help you develop stronger partnerships and this in turn can help you improve your product offering through the development of the relationship and adapting to the client's needs and this in turn will help you grow your business. If your business is stable and you have financial stability it allows you to review other opportunities and take some risks in other areas. If you're the buyer the advantages of long term are similar. It will give you stability in price control and provide you with control in your supply line. The long-term contract will also help strengthen the relationship and this will provide you with more dedicated support for your business and help you resolve issues as and when they occur. And of course, with anything, there's always a downside. If you're the seller, long-term contracts can leave you with inflexibility to adapt to demand and price and market changes. And this can limit the profitability that you can make for your business. When relationships sour, which can sometimes happen, you're stuck in a contract and it's difficult to extract yourself until the end of the term. If you're the buyer, long-term contracts also have disadvantages. You can lose the ability to take advantage of favorable market changes of pricing or new suppliers of goods available in the market. Of course, with short-term contracts, there's also advantages and disadvantages. If you're the seller, the advantages are it enables you to be competitive and take advantage of market conditions when demand is high and allows you to adapt to market pricing. If you're the buyer, you have flexibility of suppliers if you're not getting service or the quality of goods that you need. You can adapt swiftly to customer demand and any changes in the marketplace. And of course, the downsides are if you're the seller, it's harder to plan for your business and your operation, be your production line, your manpower line or your supply line of your own materials. And if you're on the other side of the contract as the buyer, it can mean you have lack of continuity for your business and your supply line and a lack of stability in particularly in the quality of goods. And this can impact your reputation. And of course, the financial terms are not usually as favorable in short term contracts as they are in long term. And once you've examined the pros and cons of both short and long term for your business specifics, you next need to consider the type of contract that you want to have. And there's many types of contracts, but I'll give you the most popular that are used in retail. The first is a fixed term contract. This will have a start date and an end date and will be automatically terminated upon expiry of the fixed date. This provides both parties the opportunity to negotiate new terms or to source new suppliers or new products based on the market conditions. Another type of contract that's commonly used in retail is called a rolling contract. And this basically is similar to the initial fixed term contract, but it's different in that while it has an initial fixed term, it requires notice of termination. 
If this notice of termination is not served, the contract is considered rolling and ongoing. Once the initial term is completed, the contract could be rolling for a years and will require notice when either party wants to terminate the contract. Franchise agreements often operate like this. By having the fixed initial term, it allows the brand time to assess performance and ensure key performance criteria are being met. It could be the buying volumes or the number of store openings or ensure that the brand is managed and operated to the standards expected. But by having the contract rolling and ongoing, it allows them to continue to take advantage of good performance, but while reserving the right to terminate notice when it suits them. Another type of contract that's frequently used in retail is called a subscription contract. And this means that it's for a fixed period, but this will automatically renew for consecutive fixed periods unless it's terminated. So, for example, one year agreement and if there's no notification for termination or non-renewal by either party, it's on automatic subscription for another year. You need to consider the position of your business, whether you're starting out or whether you're at the maturity stage and consider what's best for you with each type of contract that you're considering. You're likely to have different needs with each supplier that you're considering. Take each relationship into consideration based on size, volume, financial benefits and consider how it will impact your business and make the best choice for each contract. The second area for consideration as you draft the commercial terms of your contract is the detail of the pricing and if you add any incentives. Before you agree to any terms of pricing in a contract, you'll need to take a step back and take a holistic look at the pricing you currently have in place. No matter where you sit in the cycle of retail supply, be it as a manufacturer of goods, a distributor or selling as a retailer to an end user. Each business will have its own set of circumstances. There will always be a need to evaluate your pricing strategy to ensure that you have margin optimization, as ultimately supply and demand will play a key role in your decision making. You need to consider the effectiveness of your current pricing strategy. Review the last period sales, be it last year or last quarter, and look at the amount of deals you've done and the volumes. What portion of your total sales came from direct pricing that you had set? Or how much of your sales and volume came from deals that were special? This may mean involving bigger discounts or other forms of incentivization. Upon reflection, were they all needed? Did they genuinely add more value to your business? The reality of running a small business is that we make decisions for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes genuine commercial reasoning. Sometimes you need cash flow to pay the bills and there's money tied up in inventory. Inventory doesn't pay the rent, so you'll make a deal to release some cash to your business. And sometimes you make deals just to strengthen the relationship with the supplier. It's a good idea to take some time to analyse what you've been doing and reflect on the deals you've made and see what makes sense for your business. Ask yourself how much discounting did you do that was unnecessary. And if you find the majority of your sales were discounted, perhaps your pricing strategy is wrong to start with. Once you've taken some time to review your pricing strategy and made any necessary adjustments, you can move to the next phase, which is to set the pricing for your contracts and add any additional incentives that you feel are appropriate. Of course, you'll want to consider the relationship and the type of contract that you're dealing with. You've set your pricing. If it's a short term contract or a once off customer, you'll likely just continue with your set pricing. If there's a bigger relationship and a more long-term contract at play, you might want to consider any discounts or additional incentives. Some of the most commonly used incentives in contracts are growth incentives. These are rebates based on incremental growth. So you pay full price for X amount of value and based on increased volumes, you can offer discounts. So for example, zero to 10,000 pounds, there's no discount. 10,000 to 15,000 pounds is 2% rebate. 15,000 to 20,000 pounds, there's a 3% rebate, etc. There's also conditional discounts, which are based on various conditions set by your business, depending on the type of model you have and the goods you sell. An example of this could be to offer a discount on one product range if they buy another. This type of discount is often used when somebody is introducing new products, and it's a great way to move people from placing the same old regular orders and to encourage some additional sales and to try new products. Ultimately, your goal is to sell these new products long term. Regardless of how you choose to proceed with your pricing, the main point is to ensure that you have clarity and detail within the contract. So understanding is clear from both parties.
In any retail business, the payment for goods and services is always a key consideration, as every business needs to manage their cash flow. And this is why it's extremely important that payment terms are very specific within commercial contracts. Here are some points to consider when you are setting your payment terms. Firstly, what is the payment due date? Now, this may seem quite simple, but people can perceive things from different angles. Is it from the date the order was made? You may have your own cost or procurement involved and that's your expectation. Is it from the date the invoice was made or is it from the date that the delivery was made? You need to be clear. The second is the payment method, specifying to whom and where the payment should be made and in what format. So, for example, detailing the name of the business or the person that the transfer needs to be made into and if it's a wire transfer or cash transaction or check payment. The third area to consider is discounts. Some retail businesses will offer discounts based on payment timelines. So it's full price if it's paid on time, it's 5% discount for early payment and escalating discount for the amount of time that it's being paid in advance. This can help with cash flow management. Obviously, you'll need to work out the level of discount based on the size and volume of your own business. The fourth thing to consider is if there's any late payment penalties. If there are to be any, and if they are, what are they? And if it's interest, you'll need to state the specific level of interest that you expect. You'll also need to consider and try and specify what happens if arrears occur and payments are missed. You'll have the option to include suspension rights, and this means that you can cease delivering your services without being in breach of your contractual obligations if the other party fails to pay. And you should also include some time of the essence wording in a contract. And this is a phrase in a contract that means performance by one party at or within the period specified in the contract is necessary to enable that party to require performance by the other party. And failure to act within the time required constitutes a breach of contract. So effectively, by making payment a condition of the contract, and if the other party fails to pay on time, you'll have the rights to terminate the contract early. For most retail businesses, there'll be many transactions on a daily basis with suppliers back and forth. And in most cases, these clauses won't be necessary. But by setting in writing what happens if and when these scenarios occur, you'll protect your business. It's also worth considering that when you're drafting an agreement to payment terms, the stronger the payment terms are, the more likely it'll be that the other party will want to negotiate on strict and detailed terms for the delivery of the goods or the provision of those services. As always, relationships are a two way. You want to secure your income and the other party will need to secure their business. We now move to the fourth point, which is to ensure that the roles and responsibilities of each party and the performance obligations are clearly defined within the contract. A well-designed contract is a useful constant reference point for a good, mutually beneficial trading relationship. So taking time to get the detail right at the beginning is important. You'll often have people say that having contracts in place are a waste of time and that they're usually shut away in a drawer and never looked at again after they're signed. And in many cases, this is true, but I certainly don't think it's a waste of time. I see it as an extremely positive sign that both parties have taken time to agree the performance obligations and to understand what's expected of them. And when the relationship is going well, there's no need to look at the contract. Each is performing to the required standard. I believe that if you take the time at the start of a contract, you can flush through all of the detail and clarify the detail on every point that's needed within the agreement. This allows you to ensure that nothing is taken for granted and that there's no mismatched assumptions by either party. A good contract will enable risk to be minimized for any business. So it's really critical to be very clear about what are the roles and responsibilities of each party. What are you legally committing to do and what does the other party need to do in return? The length of detail required will, of course, depend largely on whether this is a once off contract or an ongoing supply line over a period of time, be it a short term contract or a long term contract. But regardless, you should try and include as much detail and clarity in all matters related to performance obligations. Who needs to do what? Whom needs to do it? When it needs to be done, be it daily, weekly, monthly, upon placement of an order, within what time frame, after placing an order, what formats are to be utilised, order forms, online submissions, clarify any reporting processes for problems. It'll be very business dependent, but try and include what happens if scenarios. The more detail you clarify at the beginning in the roles and responsibilities, the more problems you'll be able to avert later.
And regardless whether you're the supplier of the actual goods or the buyer of the goods, the level of detail can help both parties. If you're the buyer, you want to ensure that there's a timeline attached to delivery and where they're going to deliver it to, for example. And if you're the supplier, you want to ensure that there's detail of how the order needs to be placed, in what format and how it's supposed to be submitted. This may seem like basic detail, but there's a clear process and an understanding of the order form that needs to be used, the way it needs to be submitted, the process attached to it, and the timeline of expected delivery. If you don't specify the detail, you're leaving both parties open to making assumptions and this is where you can have mismatched expectations and this can cause problems. So it's a worthwhile exercise to spend the time at the beginning to flush through all aspects of the contract and get the detail right, match expectations on both sides and ensure people are clear about what they're legally committing to and what the performance obligations are for each. Another area for consideration about your own specific business needs is how you set out customer service policies relating to refunds and compensation, aftercare service, and any defined guarantees that come with your products. Customer service is a key component of a successful retail business, and there will be basic laws that are implied that provide protection. But outside of those, it's up to the individual business to create and define its own policies relating to the many aspects of customer service. The first area we'll talk about are refunds, and refunds are a part of all retail businesses. There are many reasons why businesses face refunds and they vary from where customers just change their mind and no business can impact that, items are not fit for purpose, delivery time arrived too late to achieve the goal, or items can be found similar at a lower price elsewhere. Regardless of the reasoning for the returns, refunds have a serious impact on retail businesses. It's estimated that retailers lose almost a third of their income from refunds. There's an operational cost, there's logistics cost, and there's a loss of revenue. Different types of industries are impacted differently. High fashion brand and footwear brands are significantly impacted with a high volume of returns. But depending on the types of goods you're selling and where you source your materials from, you could have other more complicated layers to the refund process. If you've had to source your materials or items from overseas, there may be transport costs, there may be tax implications. And if you've procured expensive items for a specific project and that item is returned, you may be left with something you didn't want that you've had to pay for and that you don't need. So to protect your specific business with its own needs, you need to clearly state as many of your own personal policies when you're creating a supplier contract specific for your business. And it's a fine balance between trying to protect your own business needs while, of course, providing good customer service. Be sure to set out the details that you require to accept a refund, including packaging, not being used, etc. as part of the contract, as this will help resolve any problems down the line. Obviously, items that are defective fall under a different category and are covered by law. Today, we're talking about personal choice for refund policies that fall outside of the legal requirements. The second area that you need to consider relating to customer service is compensation. And this will likely require a lot more thought as it will likely result from an error within your own business. And we need to be honest, mistakes happen, but it's how they're dealt with that will have a lasting impression on the customer relationship. Somebody has come to your business, made a transaction and something has gone wrong. There can be short fill deliveries, wrong items sent, missed delivery deadlines, and many other reasons. These are just some examples. But how you choose to address them will have an impact on your business, both in terms of the customer relationship and bringing that customer back to your business and in all likelihood a cost impact. So it's worth considering in advance all the likely problems that can occur within your business and setting out policies of how you will deal with them and putting it into the contract. In most cases, customers just want an issue resolved and as swiftly as possible. But in some cases, compensation will be sought setting out your policies in advance before a contract is signed for how things will be managed when things go wrong will help manage assumptions and ensure people have the same level of expectation and help find a resolution while maintaining the customer relationship. Another area to consider as part of your contract is aftercare service. If you're the supplier, you want to set out what aftercare service you provide and if you are the buyer, what you require in aftercare service. Obviously, this won't apply to every type of retail industry, but for more expensive items, technical items, phone equipment, and so on are just some examples. 
And lastly, you want to specify and define any guarantees that come with the products you're selling. And guarantees are a form of assurance that are used in customer service. You can offer many types of guarantees. There are reliability guarantees, durability guarantees, money back guarantees, and much more. Depending on what you're selling, define what guarantees you're happy to offer with your products. By setting this out in advance, you will help manage expectations and remove the opportunity for any assumptions. All of these will function as part of your customer service policies. And this leads us on to personalization of the terms and conditions to ensure that they cover your specific business needs and provide you with the relevant protection that's needed for your business. There's much to consider in this area, so here are some examples of things you can consider. Firstly, consider putting a clause in that gives you the right to delay delivery when it's due to circumstances beyond your control. You should also try and assert your right to retain ownership of your goods until they've been paid for in full. You should try and limit your liability as far as reasonable if you're unable to supply the goods. You may want to consider a term to protect the recovery of your legal costs from the other party should a dispute arise. And again, depending on the type of business you operate, you may want to protect ownership of any intellectual property. All terms and conditions should be made available to customers before the contract is made. This will help ensure that they're legally binding. Additionally, it's a good idea to display terms and conditions on the back of all contractual documents relating to your business. This would include quotations, order forms, acknowledgements of order forms, delivery notes, any documents that relate to the administration or procurement elements of your business. By having them visibly displayed and frequently displayed on all documents, this will help ensure that they are legally binding should a dispute arise. The examples given are just that examples and there's various terms and conditions you should consider to protect your business. Take time to sit down and look at all the areas of vulnerability and exposure within your business and try and put clauses in place that protect you best. We now come to talk about termination rights and exit pathways for your business. It is inevitable that you may want to bring some business relationships to an end before the expiry of the contract term. And termination is a complex area for any business and is frequently the subject of business disputes that can end up in court litigation. So today we're going to talk about the key things and provisions you need to consider when you're putting together your own commercial contracts. So the first step would be to consider who has the right to terminate. It's likely that both parties will want to reserve the right to terminate a contract. So be sure to set out clearly defined rights for both parties. And the second area to consider is to establish the various grounds that can be used for termination. Most terminations will fall into one of two categories. One is a serious breach, which requires termination. And this can include things such as non-payment or breach of confidentiality. And the other one is no fault terminations. And there's many reasons that would be considered for a no fault termination. And some even have nothing to do with the other party. You should try and include clauses that protect your business in all scenarios in the event of serious breaches, such as non-payment, such as breach of confidentiality, such as failure to deliver goods. You should also include clauses that allow you to terminate the contract for no reason. And you'll need to link this to how much notice is required for the various scenarios. The level of notice period required will differ depending on the reason you're giving notice or the grounds for termination. For example, if you're terminating for a serious breach of contract, termination may be immediate. Whereas if you're terminating without fault on part of the other party, you'll likely need to provide a reasonable notice period. And there'll be many factors that will need to be considered when drafting the termination notice period, especially in the event of a no fault termination. The other party is likely to push back and want to protect themselves. So you'll need to consider the size of the business and the volume of goods between both parties and how long the relationship has been established. Another important point to note when terminating is how the termination is supposed to be communicated and processed. When the need arises to terminate a contract, you'll need to ensure that you follow the correct procedure set out in the contract. And if this is not followed, the notice to terminate won't be valid. So having a clear process for how termination notice needs to be provided is important to enable its effectiveness. And lastly, you'll need to consider what happens at the actual point of termination. You'll need to consider how the exit plan will be implemented, how financials will be settled, what will happen to any unsold inventory. 
you may lose the right to sell a certain brand once you've terminated a contract. And this could leave you with a large volume of inventory tied up and unable to be sold. You need to think about the end of a contract in advance before the contract's in place and consider all aspects to ensure that you put provisions in place to protect your business. And lastly, we'll cover some general rules that you should adhere to when you're putting together the personal conditions of your contract. Most parties involved in small retail businesses won't have a legal background, so contracts can seem intimidating. So try and use plain English as much as possible and make everything as easy to understand as possible for both parties. You're not legal experts and you don't need to pretend to be. The second tip is to try and share all of the terms of the agreement as early on as possible. This will avoid much time wasting where non-negotiables from either party cannot be agreed upon and it will help minimise disputes later on. There's nothing worse than spending weeks negotiating a contract to get to the end and then not be able to come to an agreement on a certain non-negotiable. The third point is to ensure that you adhere to any legal issues that control your industry. Make sure you're aware of what they are in advance and are included as part of the contract. The fourth area it sounds simple, but ensure that you get the legal names, the business trading name right and included in the contract. Often you're just dealing with individuals and you may not be aware of the correct legal trading name. To ensure the contract is binding, ensure you have the details correct. The fifth point, and it's an important one, is always insert confidentiality clauses. In any business, the know-how of your day-to-day -day activities are what keeps your business up and running. It's what helps you stand out from your competitors. So making sure that this expertise and information is kept within your business is very important. And it may seem straightforward and normal business etiquette, but you want to ensure that your business is safe from any potential breaches. And lastly, I've said it before, but spend the time getting the detail right at the beginning of the contract. This will negate a lot of problems later on. Make sure all pertinent details are included. I will give you an example. If you were hiring someone to design a new website for your retail business, the contract would need to lay out what platform you want the website to work on, when the design would need to be delivered, when the website would be able to go live, what is the cost involved in delivering the website, any responsibilities that you have, including delivering copy or images. Then if the website is not delivered on time, you'll have the ability to withhold payment. Conversely, if you don't pay within the specific time period, the website designer could charge interest on the balance and both of you are protected. Getting all of this information in writing before any project begins will help ensure that both parties are on the same page and are working towards a common goal. And in the event that there are misunderstandings or things go wrong, both parties will be protected by the detail within the contract. Music